Good afternoon and welcome to the youth service for the Friday, Good Friday. <clears throat> a couple announcements, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple announcements for today. We will not be passing out the plate, so you will feel led to give an offering. The plates are in the back. Uh, just a reminder to exit quietly today. And there will be another illustration like last year after the service if you guys want to watch that. And then I invite everyone to come to the resurrection service on Sunday in the morning at 9.30. And I ask you guys to join me in a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you that everyone was able to be here today. And I just pray that you open our minds, our ears, and our hearts to what Jordan has to say tonight. And just keep everyone safe. And thank you for sending Jesus out to the world for us. Amen. I welcome you guys to the service. Good evening. I will now be reading the, um, the scripture for today. It is Luke 22, 47 through Luke 23, 7. If you don't mind opening your Bibles or following along. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the, men called, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, and Jesus said to him, Judas, would you, repay, or would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? 
And when those who were around him saw what that would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of the men struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a, as against a robber with swords and clubs when I was with you a day after day in the temple? You did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the, of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down against, among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of time, about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking, at, mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophecy, who is that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to this, their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, and you will not an and if I ask you, you will not answer. But for now, on the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God? Then, and he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have learned, we have heard our, it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole com company of them arose and brought him into Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he is Christ, a king. And Pilate said him, or asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. I now welcome the praise team to sing the first song.
I now call Micah up for the children's message. All right, hello. Do any of you know what I'm holding in my hand? Gold. Zeke, you are right. And what is the difference between fool's gold and actual gold? When you put fool's gold and actual gold next to each other, there will be no difference. You will look at it and think, oh, that's, that's gold. But there are ways to tell if it's fake. And just like how you can do a scratch test between gold and fool's gold, the same way as with our life. There are things out there that will look very similar. So this, something will look like that, and you think, okay, that's good, I need to do that. But when you do that thing, you realize that it was all just a fake. That's like Satan is a wolf in sheep's clothing, as in he, he's among us all, and he wants us, he's telling us, do that thing, come on, it's good, do the thing. But we might do it thinking, okay, where's the harm in that? But after we do it, what do we realize? And then we realize, why, do I, why did I listen to that and give in to what the world wants? So next time you guys see gold or any rock that looks similar, anything that looks even, they're nearly identical. Remember what Luke 6, 43 through 45 says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So next time you guys go out, and when you go out in the world, be careful on what you do because it may look good, but it is not actually good, and that's what Satan wants us to do. All right? Thank you. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The, the chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him then arraying him in splendid clothing and sent him back to Pilate. Then Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers to, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who, has, who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him, neither did Herod. For he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, man and release to us Barabbas, bar, bar, I think. A man who has been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city in for murder. 
Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to, le to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why, what, easel, what evil has he done? I have found him, in him no guilt, deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries and that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. I now call upon the praise team.
Would you join me as we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for, again, this night to gather together for this season of the year as we come into this week, as we are in, in the midst of Holy Week, um, leading towards Sunday, Lord Jesus. We know the blessing that is coming, but yet, Lord, may we feel the weightiness of this day as well. As we consider and reflect upon our sin and what was done to, to remove it from us, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would open our minds and hearts to your word as we hear it tonight. In your name, amen. It's not fear! It's a simple and yet profound exclamation that we hear fairly often, especially when you're raising kids. Our sense of judgment is something that puzzles me at times as I think about things that we observe, right? How, how quick and deep does that pain of injustice rise within us when we see something that we perceive to be unfair? However, if we're honest, most of these times are not really about the injustice of a situation at all. Rather, uh, it's most likely our emotional response of being kept from something that we want or forced into doing something that we don't want. Now, I have scrounged really hard for the following examples. The examples do not necessarily represent real life, so please don't start trying to put people to them. It's not fair that he gets to go to such and such an event, and I don't, just because he's older. It's not fair that they get a phone, and I don't. It's not fair that I have to help with the dishes when they don't have to do them. And it's not fair that I have to do my long math assignments when theirs is so much shorter. The examples are pretty endless, and maybe by the examples I chose, you can kind of guess what stage of parenting I'm in. But is it, any, is it true that we're any better as adults? Now, if you think about this, how unfair are those calls against your favorite team, right? But then if they happen against the other team, that's pretty neat, right? What's more, most often the situations that are inspiration for these remarks are actually probably more fair than the desired outcomes by the ones who are making that claim to begin with. So for example, if we're thinking about an older sibling having a phone, for example, and the other one is looking at that other one saying, it's not fair that they have a phone and I don't. So let's say that they had to wait till they were 15 years old to get that phone, right? And so this 13 year old saying, it's not fair that I don't have one. Well, would it be fair for the 13 year old one to get one early while the 15 year old had to wait? No, it wouldn't be. And that's not even considering the fact that you might be taking personal responsibility as a part of the equation too, right? Or let's look at that math problem. Is it really not fair that your math takes you a lot longer than like one plus one is taking for your sibling? You know, when you were that age, that's the problem that you were working on. And when they get to your age, they're going to be working on your long problems too. You see, despite how pleasant, unpleasant it can be, oftentimes parents are actually doing what is fair after all. But you know what? There are certain situations where we see injustice clearly in our world. Things that truly are unfair. So take, for example, the story of Matt Solon. On June 27th of 2017, he's an army veteran. He was out with a friend and their girlfriends one evening, enjoying a night together. And they're in this parking lot. And this person who's intoxicated starts walking towards them asking for a cigarette. Nobody had a cigarette. They thought, just move along, buddy. But he doesn't move along. Instead, he keeps coming closer and closer, and he pulls a gun. Now, Matt, seeing the situation, goes into action. He goes after the guy, takes the gun out of his hand, disarms the gun, and takes the guy to the ground. Then he calls 911 and is on the phone with the dispatch. And he's saying, here's what happened. The guy approached. We were threatened, so I got him down on the ground. I took his firearm away. It's disabled. It's on the ground. 
You hear the dispatch person talking with them, clarifying, okay, what happened? Where is the gun now? Are you holding it? When the officers arrive on scene, have your hands up, point to where the gun is, everything. And you can see at this point, the officer's coming on scene, and there he is with the phone, pointing to the ground, hands up, and everything like that. As the evening progresses, what ends up happening is that Matt Solon, he gets arrested for assault and charged with uh, felony possession of a firearm, which was the attacker's. The attacker, he walked. So we see a situation like that, and from our vantage point, we can see, you know what? That truly is unfair. Why is it the person who did good and the honorable thing, protecting his friend and girlfriends, why did he get tossed into jail and the intoxicated one get a pass? It catches in our craw when we see the injustice of that. We can also consider on a mass scale the innocent lives that are not just lost, but brutally discarded, most commonly for the mere matter of convenience. And we rightly cry out that that isn't fair or just. Tonight we encounter a similar story. And yet, while it is similar, it also couldn't really be that much different. It's the story of a true innocent condemned to death. So how is this different than the story of Matt Solon? Well, there's first of all the, the matter of how far the punishment went. Jesus condemned to death. Matt just had to spend a few days in jail. But there's also another really important distinction that we have to make. You see, Matt Solon was also a lawbreaker. Now, I didn't follow his life. I, I wasn't stalking him on Facebook to try to catch him. But if you have a conversation with someone in law enforcement and simply ask, like, how many of us have broken the law? They're going to honestly say, yeah, yeah, everybody. You know, from like a little civil infraction of jaywalking, how many of us are guilty of that, right? Um, to maybe it's just breaking a law that's really antiquated but just not on the books or off the books. Like, don't spit on the sidewalk. But the point is, at some point, every one of us has committed some sort of crime, mild as it may be. But even beyond that, you see, Matt has a bigger problem, too. He sinned against a holy and righteous God. And so we look at this instance of Matt's and this instance of Jesus, and we see that Jesus' situation was totally different. Because he was utterly and completely innocent. There was nothing that he had done at any point in his life to break the law. So though innocence, or although he was innocent, he was still condemned to death. And not only was Jesus innocent, but his trial and his subsequent execution were a total and complete sham. In an article entitled, 10 Reasons the Trial of Jesus Was Illegal, Harold Rhodes walks through a summary of a handful of ways that this, initial, this trial was indeed a farce. So first of all, we, we read through this account tonight. Weston did a great job starting this off for us. The scene opens in the garden, right? Jesus is there with his disciples. He's praying. And then we hear that Judas comes and gives Jesus a kiss and betrays him. If we pay attention to the text, we see those who are present were the chief priest, the captains of the temple, and the elders. And in this group are the very ones who paid Judas the bribe to lead Jesus to him, to lead them to Jesus. So it's not like justice is really being done here. Jesus' accuses, accusers are coming to get him. You also look for what was the charge against Jesus. There was no charge. They just grabbed him. So Jesus was arrested illegally. The second way that this was illegal is that Jesus' arrest was a private night proceeding before the high priest. So they grab Jesus, they bring him to the house of the high priest, and they have him be examined by this high priest. But Jewish law states that no session of the court was to take place before the offering of the morning sacrifice. So you should not have any trial that's starting before the sunrise sacrifice is happening. There was a given time for these things to happen. And so when Jesus' trial before the high priest is starting at night, they're breaking their law. The third reason, the Sanhedrin illegally convened before, mor before morning in their trial. So not was it just the high priest, but the whole executive council, the Sanhedrin, gathered together too. And this is significant because in this trial that was happening in the middle of the morning, there was no chance for anyone to come to Jesus' defense. Jesus was left totally to the mercy of this ruling body. The fourth reason this was illegal 
The Sanhedrin was illegally convened to try a capital offense on the day before an annual Sabbath day. The Jewish law stated that no court of justice in Israel was permitted to hold sessions on Sabbath or any of the seven biblical hol holidays. In cases of capital crime, no trial could commence on Friday or the day previous to any holiday because it was not lawful either to adjourn such a case longer than overnight or to continue them on the Sabbath or holiday. So what this means is that if you were going to have a trial that could lead to someone's execution, it had to be at least a two-day affair. And since it had to be a two-day affair and you couldn't hold proceedings over a holy day, it had to have either happened two days before or wait for it to go through. And that didn't happen. The fifth reason, Jesus' trial, as we kind of noted in the last point, only lasted one day. It was arrest that night, go before the Sanhedrin, find condemnation, go before Pilate, face execution within one day. Jewish law stated that a criminal case resulting in the acquittal of accused could terminate on the same day. So it's kind of similar to the previous rule. Um, but if a sentence of death is to be pronounced, it cannot be concluded before the following day. And this reason was because they recognized the significance of life. It was no small thing to take a life from someone. And to do so required that ample time was given to research and to study this case to see, was this person truly guilty or might they be innocent? The sixth reason was that the indictments against Jesus were false or unproven. If you look through the text of scripture and you look and to see how these trials went, you see that first of all, there's all these accusations being thrown against Jesus. These people saying, he said this, he said this. But the problem was you need two witnesses and these conflicting testimonies negated one another. Someone would say something and someone would say something different and it would just not line up. And finally, there were two people who said something about Jesus making an accusation or claim that he's going to destroy the temple. But Mark reveals for us in chapter 14, 56, that even this, they did not agree. So the high priest, those who are doing this sham trial, realize we can't get Jesus on the testimony. We're going to have to change tactics. So then they start shifting to, are you the son of God? Are you truly who you say you've been? And then they try to get Jesus for blasphemy. So in this trial, Jesus does, in a way, confess to being the Christ. And when he says such, the high priest tears his robe and he says, well, what need do we have for further witnesses? An interesting fact, too, is in doing that, the high priest also broke a rule from Leviticus. So Jesus then is accused of one thing, convicted on another, based only on his own testimony. And we see that the testimony that Jesus made was a testimony that was true. Number seven, the condemnation of Jesus by part of the Sanhedrin was illegal because those who might have voted against his condemnation were not there. We see from the other parts of the Gospels that there were some people in the Sanhedrin who followed Jesus, who trusted him. Where was Jesus buried? In the tomb of one of these men, right? And so for a unanimous decision against him, there must have been something fishy about who was allowed to be there and who was not. Number eight, the sentence against Jesus was pronounced in a place forbidden by law. Again, this was happening in the home of the high priest. According to the law, this was supposed to be happening in the courtroom, the place that the son had to show before the time would be permitted for that. Number nine, most of the Sanhedrin members themselves were legally disqualified to try Jesus. Many of these people found themselves in this position because they paid for it. Their seats were bought. And then the last one, they legally switched the charges against Jesus from blasphemy to treason before Pilate. Remember, it was blasphemy that the high priest tore his robe for. But when they bring Jesus before Pilate, it wasn't saying this man committed blasphemy. It's no, he's guilty of treason. So from the very onset, the whole charade, we see these leaders breaking their own civil and moral laws in order to seek the death of one who is truly innocent. And yet this irony is completely lost on them. It wasn't fair. All these events lead us to our text for tonight that Catherine read just a while ago. But let's turn there and refresh ourselves again from Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 13 through 25. So this is then after Jesus has been 
to Pilate, brought to Herod, and being brought back to Pilate now. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they all cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, started in the city, and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! And the third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they had asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. It wasn't fair. As we look into this account of Pilate, we may be tempted to think that Pilate here was doing an honorable thing in seeking to release Jesus. It was almost as if Pilate was able to see through the sham of these religious leaders. And we may be tempted to think Pilate's being merciful. He's being compassionate here. But mercy and compassion were not what motivated Pilate. He was a man seeking a convenient solution. A man wanting this problem to just go away. And we see this in how he tried to compromise. Look at what he does here. He says, look, Jesus, I believe he's an innocent man. And I want to release him. So to satisfy you, let me beat him and then let him go. Remember, he's innocent. So if I beat him, then you should be happy, right? Well, that's not justice. That's not mercy or compassion. But you know what? That wasn't enough. The people there were thirsting for blood. So Pilate then, he shifts gears. And he's trying to think of some other way. And he remembers, you know, we have this tradition Maybe if I can give them a choice between Jesus, who I think should just go and make everything simpler. Maybe if I, I gave another alternative to someone who's really bad, that they would, there's no way they would choose him. That's what I'll do. And so he brings forth Barabbas, the murderer, the one in a place with political, like a drop of a pin could set the whole thing off. And here's Barabbas, an insurrectionist, right? And the people are given a choice, Jesus or Barabbas. And Pilate's like, of course, they're going to choose Jesus. But then we hear the cry of the people. Barabbas. And the high priests are going around, spurring it on. Barabbas. Barabbas. Barabbas! What about this man? Crucify him! And so, Jesus was handed over to face his death. It wasn't fair. And it still isn't fair. You see, this travesty of injustice was more than just a blown trial and a wrongful execution. This was the path that the Lord took in order to solve the problem of sin. The tiny white lies, the breaking of promises, the calloused heart towards the needy neighbors in our midst. This was the payment for the liars, the cheaters, the drug pushers, the pimps, and the crooks. This was the satisfaction for the murderers, for the leaders of genocide, and for the willful participants in the Holocaust of our day. This was the payment for you and for me. And it isn't fair. Recently, Pastor mentioned in a sermon that the reason that anyone was condemned was not due to sin, but unbelief. And the cross is why. All sin, from the most insignificant in our eyes to the ones that are heinous beyond our comprehension, all of them were paid for at that moment on the cross because of Jesus. Those who believe in him have had our debts paid in full, our records cleared, and in exchange, what do we have to give? Our brokenness, our constant falling back into idolatry where we seek to make gods of our own selves, saying, I don't care what you say, I'm going to choose what I want to do today. A constant returning back to our sin, like a dog returns to its vomit. 
And it isn't fair. Praise God that it isn't fair. Soon we're going to be going into our final songs and the last scripture reading. And as we enter this time, I want to invite you to prayerfully search your hearts and ponder what God has done for you. And as you leave, we have a visual reminder for you to participate in to remind you of what Jesus has done this day for you. On your way out, in the entryway, there's going to be a whole bunch of cups. They're going to be filled with a dark liquid. And just like sin will stain your life forever, if you get the liquid on you, it will also stain. Be forewarned. But that cup does represent our sin. And as you take that cup, on the way out, you'll see a jar that has a cross on it. And take your cup and pour it in and watch what Christ has done for you. And as a reminder then, what we'll do is after the songs, we'll have one final reading. When the reading is over, um, our service will conclude. And we'll ask that you exit in silence and again, prayerfully consider what Jesus has done for you as we do that. Amen.
The next reading is from Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through um, 46. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, were led to, away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they cast lots to divide their, his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot, I mean, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering sal him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over them, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged rail railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Gen then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit your spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. <laughs> 